All right, so we are going to make a goblet this evening. <clears throat> uh, just going to show you first off what we're going to what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to start by making a little bowl. So this is about the one, the one we're going to do is probably two and a half inches in diameter or so. It's just a little thin bowl. I've got a um, a little decorative detail here, just a little bead. Um, there's a trick to that. We'll, we'll get to the trick in a bit. And a little quarter inch by about a sixteenth inch long tenon on the bottom of that bowl. And that tenon fits into a hole about a sixteenth of an inch deep, quarter inch diameter in the stem. The fit there is is loose. It's not a structural tenon. Uh, it's mainly just registration. I glue these together with uh, two-part epoxy, and so the tenon gives me a little bit of of glue surface, but it also centers that that stem on the bowl. And then on the bottom, same thing. The <clears throat> the um, stem has got a little tenon on it and the foot of the goblet has got a little a little hole and the way I like to make these is a pretty simple foot uh, the bottom has got a a rim around it uh, that the thing sits on and the interior there is recessed a bit and that gives me a few things one is is it looks better you turn the thing over and you see some intentional turning rather than just part it off. Um, having this rim around the, the edge is handy because after you turn these, sometimes after a couple of days, they'll they'll twist just a little bit and then the whole goblet is is teetering and rocking. And just rubbing that on a on a sheet of sandpaper, um, I usually will hit it with about 320 or something um, to take off the high spots and it'll sit flat again. If you try and make the base perfectly flush, you've got the whole thing to try and sand down again. So this gives you just a little bit that you have to, to deal with. Uh, some of the other things that I like to do um, with these, I, I like the, the look of um, some kind of figured wood. Uh, this happens to be cotton wood. Uh, on the top and the bottom, I use the same wood for the top and the base, and then I go for a stem that usually, not always, but usually is dyed black. Um, it shines up really nice with a with a glossy lacquer, and I think it just gives it a nice look. The stem is reasonably simple in form and allows me to show off the, the wood in the cup. Uh, and the base is just there kind of as a highlight. At least that's my, my thought. Um, so let's get going. <clears throat> Got a piece of wood here. This is a black ash burl uh, that I got from, oh, now I can't think of their names. They show up at the symposium every year with all this nice burl. Um, they've got a, ni a lot of nice little small burls. Uh, this particular piece... I've cut round on, on the band, so I actually turned a little bit uh, this afternoon just to kind of save a little time, uh, but not enough to actually do anything. One of the things I look at when I'm picking up a piece of burl like this is I like the natural edge uh, on my goblets, but I also like the figured wood. We are going to make a natural edge goblet out of this tonight but I might actually not ordinarily um, because I'm looking at this and I don't see a lot of burl figure. Uh, there's a little bit there. There's maybe a little bit trying to peek through the bottom. Um, but if, this is, if there is any burl figure in here, it's probably all really close to the top. And if we cut a natural edge piece out of this, we're going to cut a lot of that away. Um, 
but I want to do a natural edge piece for you anyway, so that's fine. Doesn't matter. Um, but I do this. I'll I'll cut these out, and and as I'm cutting them out of the burl, I'll kind of go exploratory. Like so, I'll make some slices with a bandsaw where I think I want to take wood off, and then I'll look at it and see what the figure is looking like, and and kind of zero in on the piece that I want to make make something out of. Um, so anyway, just some thoughts about. <clears throat> about the burl. Let's get going here. So I've got a step center. Let me get my camera where you can see what we're doing. I just dropped that burl on the floor. So that's great. All right. Go chase my burl down. And I've got a step center and a a small, this is one of Cindy Drozda's uh, live centers. I really like them. They're nice and teeny. I like the step center for this. I have found that it will grip pretty well, especially in these, in these small pieces. Um, I, don't have, uh, I don't have a drill press, so I really can't safely flatten off the top of this. Um, and I found that this step center will, will kind of grip pretty well. And if it slips, I can tighten up the tailstock and it'll, and it'll catch again. Um, my experience with these uh, four prong centers is once they start to slip, uh, that's all they'll do anymore. So I uh, like the step center. Had good luck with it. Did you pre-mark the centers on that? I, I did. But um, I was just trying to save us a little time. What I, will, what I normally will do is, uh, and we'll see it. I'm going to move this around. Um, but it'll, it'll go on rough because it's hard to cut a small circle on the bandsaw. Uh, and I'll just, I just guess at the center usually. There's often one point uh, on the top where, where I had my template for the, for the bandsaw. But... Um, I just usually guess uh, because it's going to change anyway as soon as I get a little bit done on this. You'll see that. Uh, I've got this. It's either a half inch um, or a three-eighths bowl gouge, depending on whether you like to measure the shaft or, the, or between the flutes. And I use a – it's pretty close to an Ellsworth. I'm not going to claim it is, but um, – Pretty close to Ellsworth with the long swept back wings. So the first thing I want to do with these, and with any natural edge bowl, no matter how big it is, is I want to make it round. And like I said, I cheated a little and, and took a little of the, of the corners off of this ahead of time just to save us some time. Um, but the next step is I want to try and even out the top of this goblet. If, if I've got a natural edge, it's waving all around, up and down, and, and everything. And if you end up with, with one piece that's a lot higher than the rest of it, it just looks out of balance. And so what I like to do is find the high spot and just turn the piece around. There's the other high spot, and it is, so here we go. There's one high spot, and that's the other one, and it's lower than its mate on the other side. So all I'm going to do is loosen the tailstock and tip it a little bit to try and even those out. So there's that high spot. That's pretty close, so that's about the same. You got to kind of, you know, make a judgment call whether you're looking at the the top of the bark or the middle of the bark or the bottom of the bark. But anyway, those two high spots are pretty close. Now I want to look at the low spots. There's one. Uh, there's the other one, and it's way off. So I can tip this again. 
that way. Or did I go the wrong way? No, I did went the right way. There's a low spot. There's another low spot. Let's check the high spots. There's still, uh, that needs a little more. Just takes a couple of times. And I like moving the moving the piece in the live center because that leaves most of the wood up here. Uh, if I were to move the move it around in the step center, I'd lose more wood here because this is now I'm gonna I'm gonna cut off this anyway, but it kind of leaves it mostly round up here if you move it at the at the tail. All right, so I'm not unhappy with with that. That's actually pretty good. About as well balanced as this odd looking piece is going to be. So now we can start making something kind of more bowl shaped. Let me see if this will help a little. <clears throat> Lighting is, is really hard. Um, let me see if this. Nope, that didn't do it. Um, I'll make sure you can see something at some point. It's spinning now anyway. There's nothing to see. So just a, a bevel rubbing, rubbing cut with the gouge. Flutes at about 45 degrees here. I've got that pretty well rounded. I'm going to take off some of these corners on the on the back side. See there it slipped. I just give it a crank with a tail stock. It grabs again. All right, I've got rid of some of the mass. Now I want to look for my bowl. I am, okay, I'm, I'm cutting the wrong way, generally. Um, usually, you want to cut on a, on a side grain piece like this, you want to cut from the middle towards the edge. Um, the problem I have with that is with this gouge, uh, if I'm rubbing the bevel, that's as close as I can get to the to the center. Uh, it's hitting the hand wheel on my on my tailstock, and so I really can't cut with that with a regular push cut from the center out because I really can only get half of it. Um, but I found that especially with these burls, they don't have a lot of of um, of grain going on if it's a really burly. And so I can get away with making a wrong direction cut if I come back and clean it up later. Also, when I'm cutting this way, um, let's see if you can see this here. I am standing now looking straight down the bevel of my gouge. And I have found that I can visualize the curve that I want of that bowl a lot better if I'm looking down the gouge. If I'm cutting with a regular push cut and I have to be out of the way of my tailstock, I'm standing way over here and I can't really see the form that I'm making. So <clears throat> that's why I like to to make this cut because I can I can just swing right around and make a nice um, nice form out of that. Let me get I've got a lot of wood here that's going to disappear. And that does not bother me at all. It used to be that I thought, oh, I've got this wood, I have to use it all. I've come to realize that I'm using this wood. Um, I'm trading shavings for the form I want. So it's OK. 
Now, I'm going to put what I called earlier a decorative bead on this piece, but it's really, um, it's really not. It's really a tenon. Um, these are my uh, tenon measuring things. This is for my VM100 Vicmark jaws. Between the point and that corner is a good distance for the proper distance for a uh, for a tenon and between the point and the outside corner is the proper distance for a dovetail and so these I've made one of these for every set of jaws I got uh, painted them blue because when they fall on the floor in the shavings I can see them I don't have any shavings that are blue so I want to make a tenon that is about that big. <clears throat> That's about right there. Now, I don't want this very big because I may or may not choose to keep it. If I choose to keep it, I don't want it to look like a tenon. And if I choose if I choose at the end to remove it, I don't want to, I'm going to be reversing this, this piece in a jam chuck or something, or in a, in a friction chuck between centers, and I don't want to have to take off a lot of wood, because it's going to be kind of a precarious thing. I'm going to have a quarter inch tenon on the bottom here. I've not got a lot of grip, so I don't want a lot of wood that I have to take away. So that's two reasons that I make a small... small tenon there. So let's get the spindle gouge and get a little... The thing that I care about in this tenon is the is that bottom bit. I care I care that there's a good groove, a good clean groove for the jaws to grip in there. Uh, for something this small, I don't really care about the rest of the shape. So there's a nice, nice groove in there, but it really more looks like a more looks like a little bead than anything else. Let me do one thing. Change the lights a little. You can kind of see what we've what we've got going. I've discovered that um, if you guys can see this really well, I can't. I've just turned off all the lights in my shop except for one little little light that's bouncing off my my shirt here, and. Uh, so that's where we are. Uh, need to clean up this surface. So that's the next step. I have to see to do that. So I want my tool rest nice and close. <clears throat> I'm going to use um, the the wing of this gouge, and I don't know what this. Somebody probably has a name for this cut. I just call it a high shear angle pull cut. The gouge, I'm going to show you my position here. I've got the gouge like way down below my pocket here. You can't even see it. It's below the lathe. I'm holding on right at the top of the handle. So that's a pretty sharp vertical angle there. Make sure it's on the tool rest, rubbing on the wood, and then it's just a matter of spinning the gouge with my right hand until it starts cutting. And just roll the gouge around to follow the contour of the, of the bowl. I'm, I can't get here because my tool rest gets too far away, but I'm getting some 
pretty decent shavings off of that. I found that this this cut I've been really successful with making clean cuts on bowls of all different sizes on the outside with with that cut. I've got to finish I haven't cut up here yet, so I've only gone down here. I need to move the tool rest. But what I've what I've found with this is the bevel angle, you know, you normally you want to float that bevel or ride the bevel or rub the bevel or whatever people say. Um, the main reason you do that with most most of the time is that bevel is actually providing support for the cutting edge. And in this particular case, it turns out I don't really need that. Um, I can get the bevel all the way off of there, and that angle is is so steep, this gouge is not going to skate. So it's got really no place to go because that cutting angle is so steep. So the tool rest is your tool support with this cut. The, the challenging thing with it is that the bevel angle actually controls the direction of the cut. And so if you roll this tool over too far, you'll end up with, with waves across your, your surface. So that's the thing that needs practice is, is uh, being able to control that tool and follow, follow the surface of your cut. All right, let's finish this up. Got to be very careful coming off the edge. Because I don't want to, I don't want to bounce off the, off the edge of this and rip the bark off. I want to, you know, be nice and gentle and, and, and keep that bark as much as I can. All right, I think Dave, that's... This is Chris. I had a question about that. Yeah. So you obviously need to do that when you're doing your finishing. But when you first cut this, you actually came in from your left side. Yes. And I assume that helps hold the bark in place as well. It, it does, because when you're cutting, when you're cutting this direction, um, you, that bark is supported by the rest of the wood. So you're not um, lifting it off. If you're, if you're coming this way, yeah, you're kind of trying to lift it off. So if you're cutting this way, you've got to be very gentle so that you're sure that you're cutting and not pushing on that wood. Uh, you don't want to push the bark off. Now, my philosophy on natural edge bark is if the tree wants it to stay on, if the wood wants to keep its bark, it'll keep its bark. If the wood doesn't want to keep its bark, it'll fall off. And I don't really worry about it. Um, you can super glue your bark. I hate super glue. I hate the smell. I hate the burning sensation in my eyes. And I've actually, if the bark starts to come off, I oftentimes will just let it go and then get a, you know, dental picks or a wire brush or something and, and take it off down to that uh, cadmium layer right between the bark and the wood. And that looks as, as good as anything usually. Uh, if you can keep that kind of natural looking, I don't sand it, I don't do anything, I kind of keep it natural. All right, so now... I would normally sand this whole piece. Uh, I sand these up to about 800. Um, get that all nice and sanded. As part of sanding, make sure you don't lose this tenon that we've made. Uh, keep it, keep that nice crisp corner. If it if it rounds off as you're sanding it, come back with a good sharp gouge or a point tool 
and make sure that you've got a tenon there. Now I want a quarter inch tenon on the bottom of this. Um, <clears throat> the way I like to measure my tenons is with a wrench. I have sharpened the top of this wrench so it kind of acts like a, a parting tool scraper. I don't want exactly a quarter inch. I want something a little bit smaller because I don't want to have to press fit this into a teeny spindle. Uh, I want to have some, some room to, to play with it. It's really not a structural piece. It's, a, it's not a structural tenon. It's, it's just registration. So this wrench is a 15 64ths wrench, so slightly under a quarter. Um, actually, a quarter inch wrench is made to fit a quarter inch nut, and so it has to be bigger than a quarter inch or it won't go around the nut. So this one's probably closer to a quarter uh, than a quarter would be, if that makes sense. I'm not going to size this right next to the piece. I'm going to come out here a little ways because this is not the world's best parting tool. There. Just as it slipped on, <coughs> it was sized properly. Now I can come back with a good parting tool and just match that, that tenon size there. <coughs> I don't need a very big tenon, but I do need this bit here to be small enough to go down the center of my chuck. Um, I'm going to try and keep this because I've got a center point here and if I need to turn this around and maybe I decide we want to take off this this tenon or bead, whatever you call it, um, I want to be able to chuck this back up. So I want to keep this if I can, but it needs to get small enough that I can get it in the chuck without it interfering with the operation of the chuck jaws. So that should do it. So like I said, at this point, I would have sanded this all the way to probably 800. Um, I'll let you look at something different for a minute. <clears throat> so now we're going to flip it around, and we're going to turn the inside of this of this bowl, this little tenon that I've made is going to work because I've got, okay, not because I've got a Vicmark chuck, but because the Vicmark chuck that I have has got dovetail jaws on it. And so these dovetail jaws have a good, a good corner right here that will grab that tenon. Um, if you have different jaws, like I've got this, uh, these one-way jaws, they have a completely different profile. The inner piece is straight, and then it's got this little, I don't know what you call it, tooth on the top. I would need a completely different uh, shape on the bottom of my bowl to fit into these jaws. So, oop, match what you've got and work with what you got. Um, and if you can't work with what you got, get some more, because that's not a bad thing. So the other thing about this, I have sized this gauge so that if I make a tenon that big, it fits exactly. Uh, these jaws are turned on a lathe originally as one piece and then they're sliced apart. So they are at a perfect circle when you've got a space between the jaws that's the same as the um, whatever blade they use to cut them apart. Turns out it's a little less than or right around an eighth of an inch or so. So the advantage of that is I get contact all the way around but also since I might keep that as a decorative bead on the bottom of this bowl I don't want not notches in there from, from the corners of these jaws. So that perfect circle means I don't get a lot of marring on that either. So that's a good Dave, thing. Dave, this is Jenny. Do you yeah. have a point in your live center or is it just 
hollow. Right now I've got, um, this is a cup center. So there's a point in the middle of the cup. Okay, does it have like interchangeable? This one has interchangeable. So this one came with this cup center and a, a cone center, a little point um, that I'll bring out later because I'll need it. Thanks. All right, let me turn this camera around a little bit and we can do the bottom of this bowl. Now, let's see. Don't get seasick, anybody. There we go. One thing that I think about right now is do I want to do this? <clears throat> One option that I have is to bring the tailstock up for some support, but when I do that, I really don't have a lot of room uh, to cut. Uh, but sometimes if I'm not confident in that tenon, I'll bring the tailstock up like this and I will just get as much as I can cut to get rid of the, the roughness here. Because this is uneven and every time this comes around and hits the tool, it's going to bounce a little bit. And if I didn't trust this tenon, I'd go ahead and get rid of as much of that as I could, just the, just the uneven surface. But I think we're going to be okay, and we don't need to do that, and we'll find out if I'm right or not. Make sure I'm not hitting the edge. And I'm turning it about, oh, half speed for this lathe, about 1,500 or so. I want to go real easy, there's a lot of air, then wood, then air, then wood, then air, then wood. So it's, it's going to bounce a little. So until I get down to solid wood, down in, towards the middle, I want to be just gentle with this. Change my tool rest just a little bit. This is just a little bowl. I found that making these little bowls, not necessarily for goblets, but just as a little practice item is kind of fun. Just grab a, find a branch, cut off a chunk. Oop, I got a little catch there. I'm getting a little aggressive down, down at the bottom. Trying to talk and turn. All right. But the, these little bowls make kind of a nice, quick little practice item. And if you're doing them for practice, one of the things you can practice is how small can I make that tenon and with a teeny tenon, how aggressive can I be? And it's really helpful to help learn, um, you know, what, 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 what your jaws will, your, your chuck will actually hold, hold on to. All right. All I'm doing now is I'm kind of getting a feel I haven't gone very deep yet, but I'm trying to get a feel for the, the wall thickness. I need to go a little deeper before I can make any judgments on that. But I like to, I do this with any size bowl that I'm turning. I like to make a thick walled version initially uh, and get a consistent wall thickness. I've got a little, it's a little thick down here, thicker than it is at the edge. Um, the reason I like to do that is it's a whole lot easier to find 
to, to, it's easier to match the inside curve and the outside curve when you've got some material here to work with and it's not flexing, it's not flopping around. And if you miss, you've got, you've got plenty of material to, to readjust. So I've got a reasonably good wall thickness down to where I kind of turn the corner right down there. So I'm happy with that for now. Now I can start making this thinner. As I'm cutting through here, I can't really see, once I get inside, I can't see my gouge. Can't see where I'm cutting. But I can look on the opposite side and I can see the, the ridge that I'm cutting. I can see what I'm cutting and what I'm leaving. Since I've got a fairly consistent wall thickness here, all I have to worry about is keeping that, that ridge, that step that I'm cutting, keeping it consistent as I cut it away. Little air happening. So I was just watching on the opposite side and trying to trying to cut an even step. And if I keep doing that, I'll get down to a good, if I keep everything consistent and even, I'll end up with an even thin wall. And I'm only doing, I'm only doing the outside. I've, I've still got a lot of material in the middle to take take away. Um, that's just habit. Um, this piece is probably not going to flex that much, but if you get a bigger bowl, uh, especially natural edge, as you start to get this edge thinner, it's going to start to flex and move, and so you want to leave some mass in the middle uh, to help maintain some control. <clears throat> the cut, I trying to start it with the gouge with the flute totally closed, so totally vertical right here, with the bevel pointed in the direction I want to cut. And once I get a little bit of a cut started, I've got a bit of a shelf. I just lost a chunk of bark. But I got a bit of a shelf for that for that bevel to ride on and I can open the flute up and it won't skate back. So this piece just fell off. So this we're we're practicing what I preach. It's like the bark fell off, so fine, let the bark come off. Don't care. That actually looks reasonably cool without the bark. So okay, I won't take all the bark off, but I want to. All right. Now I got all I have to do is at this point is find the bottom of the bowl. Get rid of all this junk. And I keep stopping and checking because I want to I want to know where I am and the bottom of this is still pretty thick yet. So I know I can come in here, rotate my gouge until I just get a little shaving and it starts cutting. That means I'm where I started. I started here in the middle, but when I rotate this and I get that, that edge just to start cutting, I know that I've kind of matched that surface and I can keep going and I don't end up with a big, with a big ridge. Um, transition spot. All right, a little more down here. Get rid of this center cone. thing you got to watch out for at this point is you're watching the bottom because that's where you're cutting 
and you're paying attention to making a nice cut down there and following the bevel and and sure enough you're just about done and you whack the shaft of your tool in the natural edge as it comes around so you gotta watch for for multiple multiple things happening one more finishing cut down here and I think that's all right let's see what that looks like what if we you can probably see that a little better I sure can't it's dark in here all right, so that's we've got a reasonably good surface. Uh, we've got a little nice figure going on in there. That's going to be fun. Uh, <clears throat> when you're making a natural edge piece, uh, there is a balance between uh, too th well thin enough and too thin. I tend to leave them a little bit thicker uh, than I might. Otherwise, because I want to actually see some of this edge. If I make it too thin, that edge just just disappears. All right, so all that bark can come off, and then we get some nice little little pieces. There's a little. Anyway, okay. I love wood. I like looking at wood. I like talking about wood. But we got to move on. So now we have a little bowl. We can decide at this point or later um, if we want to keep that uh, so-called decorative element. I'm not going to do it, but if we wanted to remove it, scrap piece of wood like this, chucked up, turned. You can put your your bowl against it. If it doesn't fit well, just turn it. Scrap piece of wood. Just turn it down some more. Um, and then bring the tailstock up, and you can, if we wanted to, we could take off this bead. Um, but like I said earlier, it's good to leave this bead small because this is kind of a precarious hold, just jammed against this little tenon here uh, holding this bowl on. So if you leave this tenon really big so that you get supposedly a good purchase, a good grip on your with your chuck, you've got a lot more wood to take off and a lot more risk uh, that you're going to break that little tenon off right in the middle of trying to do that. So small tenon, good. Big tenon, bad, I guess. I don't know. All right. <clears throat> so that was the bowl. Now I want to make a f the base. So for the base, I've got another piece of burl here um, what I like to do is I like to scavenge these pieces from whatever I cut off to find the parts for the bowl so I, I like a little bit of a hint of continuity so this has got just a little bit of burl figure right here um, there is no burl figure on the bottom so that doesn't go very deep but there's a little bit of figure here uh, that will just give a hint of continuity between this and and the bowl when they go together. So this is just really really rough cut on the on the bandsaw to not even really anything. I wouldn't even call it round. It's just roundish. And I don't care. I'm just grasping it in the chuck. I'm not trying to have a really great, um, I don't need a really great um, grab on that. Most of this wood is going away here. What I've found that I like um, is when the, the base, and this seems to work for me no matter how long my, my stem is, 
but when the base is roughly uh, half, a little more than half the diameter of the bowl. So if I look at this bowl, this is right now about the same diameter as this. So I need to make this a bit smaller. That's easy to do. Smaller is easy. So I want to face this off. Start by just finding something kind of flat. And then I'm just going to eyeball that about there is a good diameter for this base. I like them to have a little bit of a little bit of a curvature. And I'm going to make the center either flat or slightly concave. Because when I put the stem on here, I want to make sure it sits right down flush on this piece. I don't want it uh, rocking or, 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 you know, I want it sitting fully on that piece. So a little flat or concave there helps that, helps that a bit. I'm going to grab my, well, there went my gouge on the floor. <clears throat> grab my spindle gouge. and just define that edge, undercut it slightly so that if it's undercut a little bit, it kind of gives the, the piece the illusion that it's floating a little bit off the table. Let me see if I dropped the gouge on the, on the business, oh, I think not. So just a little shear scrape on this. At this point, I'm going to sand this all the way up to whatever, 800 usually for me. And I want to drill a hole for, our, for the tenon on the stem. So i got to change out some stuff here. I'm going to drill this hole using, bring this in a little, it's a router bit. So this is a, a flat bottom router bit. It does have a teeny, teeny, teeny little bread point, but these are great. They make a flat bottomed hole. Uh, they cut really well. Um, they run at high speeds, but they make a flat bottom hole. If I put a brad point bit in there, the brad points on the end of those bits are about a sixteenth of an inch. If I make a sixteenth of an inch deep hole here with another sixteenth of an inch brad point going down, I'm probably going to run through the bottom of my piece. Um, if I uh, use a traditional drill bit, I'm going to have a little triangle hole shaped hole and it's not actually going to... Uh, be what I want. So, I don't like measuring so much, so the way I'm going to drill this hole and know how deep it is, I'm going to advance the tailstock until that just starts cutting. I'm going to note where my wheel is, my hand wheel. I know that I've got a 16 thread per inch uh, threads in this quill. So if I want a sixteenth of an inch deep hole, one revolution with that handle, and I'm done. So that makes it really easy for me to to drill these and know I'm not going too deep. I don't have to count little marks on the the side of my tailstock quill or anything like that. All right, so now we can flip this around and do the bottom. 
So we can take it out of the chuck. And I have got just a scrap piece here from a different project. This is actually a piece from the um, angels I made for the Denver Club in November. The center out of the, the piece that's, that's missing. So what I've got here, just a flat piece. I've kind of dished it out. I've used this numerous times. Dished it out a little bit and I've left a nub, a quarter inch nub, that matches the hole in the bottom of this piece. And I need to work on this. This is rocking in here. So I need to throw it on the floor. Hold on. All right. So I need to dish this, this out a little more because I want it to set nice in this, in this hole here. So I'm just kind of guessing is at what what that curvature is or was guessing at about a quarter inch nub by about a sixteenth of an inch tall and a little more in the center has to come off it's still rocking. I may need to cut a little off that that stub. Yeah. A little more off of this tenon. All right, that's sitting nice and flush on that. So I can bring the, the tailstock up. Lots of cranks. And hold this piece on there. So this is just a compression fitting or compression chuck, whatever you call it, friction, drive, I don't know what we want to call it. I need a little more room for my banjo. Now all I gotta do is get rid of all this wood that's not part of the base, not part of the bottom. There it is. So at this point, I found the outer rim pretty close. I need to define that a little better. It's got a little, needs a little cutting. There we go. So I found the outer rim and I've cut a little bit here. At this point, I'm going to sand this. This is going to become the, the ridge around uh, the base that I'm going to set this on. And so I'm going to sand this outer surface, and I'm going to decide roughly that I want that to be my rim. I can get rid of a little more of this wood now. But now I need to hold this on here and get the tailstock out of the way. Um, so we're just going to tape it. This is um, concrete, brick, and grout um, masking tape. It sticks to concrete, so it's got to be sticky. Um, Learned this one from Cindy, Cindy Drozda. She uses this 
And it was like, oh, that's genius, because I'd been using blue tape. And I always knew blue tape's meant to come off. It's not made to stick. <clears throat> this stuff sticks a lot better. So now, get the tailstock out of the way. Get rid of this nub. And finish off the bottom. I like to take it in steps. I like to make sure that it's flat. Maybe I'll check it with a pencil or something, but make sure it's flat. And then I make it a little bit concave. If I start with it flat, then I know everything I cut now is concave. It's going to be recessed. I can also leave a little nub there and see exactly how deep I've gone until I take the nub away. And then I'm going to come back with my spindle gouge and cut from the center out. to Make that bottom nice and flat and give myself a nice well-defined rim right here. Then I can sand this interior bit and that piece is pretty well done. And now we get to move on to the fun bit, I suppose. I count myself um, mainly a bowl turner, holoform, um, bigger things. I get along pretty well with bowl gouge. Uh, spindle gouge is a little bit on my... Uh, spindle work is definitely stretch for me. So um, I'm not saying that as an excuse. I'm just saying it doesn't come naturally. <clears throat> but I've really enjoyed these goblets as a kind of a, for me, kind of a transition thing. It's like, okay, I can make a bowl and I can, you know, play with some interesting ways of holding things on the lathe. Um, now I got to make a spindle. And so it's just kind of a, um, a good excuse or transition or whatever for me uh, to get into um, a little spindle turning. So I suppose that's the way it is. Clean this off a little so you have a chance of seeing what we're doing. So this is um, maple, just very straight grained maple. I went into woodcraft um, a while ago and I looked around the store until I found the straightest grained piece of maple I could find and bought it and cut it into strips and cut the strips into lengths. Uh, this piece I have made round already with my roughing gouge just to save us a little time. Um, if I could convince my table saw to make a reasonable cut, which is we're, um, we're never on the same patch, me and my table saw, uh, but I could make these square and then they would fit in the, in the chuck pretty well. But that's more, that's more flat work than I like to do. Um, so first thing, I'm just going to face off the, the end here and make this a little bit recessed, a little concave, because this is going to be the top of the, of the spindle and it's going to sit on the bowl that, uh, that we made. And so if it's a little bit recessed, it will sit down nicely. And the edge that I want down, I want on the bowl will be on the bowl and it won't be flopping around on there. What am I looking for? I'm looking for my router bit again. 
same thing here. Bring it up to speed. Turn that until it just starts cutting. One revolution is a sixteenth of an inch deep. And so I've got a nice square hole. I found that, for me at least, that sixteenth of an inch is enough to, to register uh, the, the piece. Uh, and it's not enough that I have to worry about uh, cutting into that hole as I'm um, shaping this, this spindle. I like turning spindles uh, not between centers but in pin jaws. And the thing I like about that is when you're turning between centers, you've got to maintain um, compression. So the tailstock, the live center, has to push on the piece so that it engages in the drive center and will go round, because that's what we do. Um, but now this little spindle is not going to be a big deal, but a longer piece, that compression uh, is not really your friend when, when you, you're making a really long piece because you have to maintain some compression there and it's just going to start whipping as you get it thinner. So I like to set the, the piece uh, in the center of that hole I drilled and then tighten down the, the jaws and then just give the tailstock just a little bit of a just a little bit of a turn. So it's not really it's not really pressing hard on on this spindle. It's just holding the end so that it's not wobbling around. All right. Let's see if you can see what we got going on here. I got to get some that might help a little bit. So I'm going to start at the tailstock in and work my way uh, towards the headstock. That way, I've, when I make this thin, um, I've still got some mass down here <clears throat> to be able to keep turning it, um, make it go round. Yeah. So the other thing that we're going to do is I'm going to, before I get too, too far, I want to get some marks on here. Um, the piece I'm going to make is pretty much this. So a flare at the top and bottom and a bead in the middle. And in order to put a bead in the middle, it's helpful to know where is the middle. So I have to leave some room down here for a tenon. That could be 11, so five and a half is the middle. That just gives me a little bit of a reference of where to go. Now it's just take away all the wood that's not that's not the that's not the spindle. So I don't want to get too aggressive with this. This is just rubbing the bevel and pointing the gouge in the direction I want to go and taking away some wood. If I feel like I'm pushing it too hard, I'm going to stop and come back, take a smaller cut. Whoop. That was probably pushing it too hard. The way I've been successful, one way I've been successful with these is as a first step, not try and go too thin too fast. But just kind of find find a shape. And I get about to this point. And I am looking for basically the diameter I want my bead. 
Get rid of some of that fuzz. So I'm going to put a bead right here. And I'm going to go ahead and do that now because then I have something to aim for. Little, little kick there. Such a small bead, I really didn't cut a, a relief to turn into. Normally, you might, on a bigger bead, you might cut a V on each side so you have some place to go. The key here is just try and make something that's pretty even on the left and the right side. And then a nice chamfer on either side of it. If you guys, if you need a different camera thing, holler, and I can try and move it, but I'll try not to hit it with my head too. All right, so now I have a bead. I have the end here. I just need to finish the, finish the middle parts, right? Get a little aggressive and things, things tend to move. You gotta watch out. Got a little vibration happening. So I can come in and support with my hand, with my fingers. Get this down. I don't want to go too thin too fast then you don't have a lot to work with when you need to refine it. That cut I just made, I started out here, the entirety of, of steering that cut was me rocking from left to right and pushing the gouge, the end of the gouge with my hip. So there's a lot of body movement going on. I'm not really, my fingers here are not really providing a lot of support. Mostly it's just giving me a little tactile feedback into what's going on and giving me a little bit of, of support um, for the gouge. So I've got my fingers. I'm cradling the tool rest. I've got the tool rest scooted over that way so that I can get underneath it and, and reach the reach the spindle. Just rubbing my fingers on there. Gouge is on the tool rest. My thumb is on the gouge. My elbows are against my side. I've got a lot of contact between me and the gouge and the wood. And I can actually, with my f left hand fingers, if I'm making a small cut, just a little bit of a shave, I can feel that cut before I can see the shavings come off the gouge. So that really, really helps with that, that tactile feedback, if you will. I can feel what's happening on the wood and I'm also giving the wood a little bit of support with my fingers, but I just really think it's it's a little more about just maintaining contact so your your body knows where the gouge is and you don't have to watch it move around all right that's not too bad so dave i've never turned any things this small on a spindle do you ever like just sand the rest of that down there instead of using your gouge is that an option or not not 
Not really. See, I've got, I want to maintain a crisp edge here, and I want to maintain a reasonably crisp um, thing going on next to the next to this bead. Hmm. And sanding, you just tend to take all that off. Um, also, uh, to be honest, I mean, when I first started doing this, I broke a whole bunch of these. Uh, but I found pushing myself and, you know, forcing myself to learn how to make the cut, uh, which I am still in the process of learning. Um, but I found that was, that was a whole lot better for me than trying to sand uh, to get the shape. Mm. Uh, just, just from a matter of, of practice. You know, you can buy a, a big plank of, of straight-grained maple for not very much money and get about 100 spindles and and practice all you want and you got good kindling for your fireplace when you're done at least that's my opinion okay thank you but since you mentioned sanding i'll talk talk briefly about um about sanding these and then we'll move on to the to the second half of it um, I've got these sanding <clears throat> discs, two-inch discs, and I save them. After I'm done with the power sanding, really they're only used on the outside edge. Um, I can't really stand to throw things away, so the sandpaper in the middle is still good. Um, <clears throat> sanding on these, I do the same kind of body contact thing. I'm leaning on the headstock. I'll bring my left hand around and just cradle my hands together. I've got my right wrist resting on the on the tool rest. So I end up again with with lots of lots of contact. I can feel the wood. I can feel if I've got any any ridges in there that I need to that I want to smooth off or sand out. Um, and I can, I, it's just, and if this gets really thin, thinner than I've made it here, uh, having this extra support with this other hand really, really helps. I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in, in touching the wood and, and, and maintaining contact <clears throat> with, with the wood. All right, let's do this bottom part. There's a lot of wood to get rid of. The thing that I've discovered, for me anyway, that's harder than getting this thin is when I'm doing the second half below the bead, is making it match the top. So my first step is I'm trying to just match this diameter here, and that's not too bad. And now I've got to come in whoo, and just get rid of some wood. So if that cut isn't working for you, you can nibble away wood this way, find the bevel, bevel has to, has to ride, but you can just kind of nibble away. When you find it, there it is, works pretty well, but this tends to put pressure sideways on the piece, whereas cutting this way is putting pressure towards the headstock. So whatever works. All right, now I'm going to try and match this curvature here. I'm 
not too bad. This is, I find this difficult. When I cut this top bit, this cove was cut from right to left. This was cut from left to right. Now I've got to match this one by cutting the other direction. Drives me nuts. But it's good practice again. You can make the same cut from both directions. There we go. That's not, not bad. I think that's going to work once I get that down there, thinner. And this is now I'm at the point for me where I'm thinking, wow, that, hang on, let me get your backdrop here. That ended up a little thinner than this piece. I know that this camera doesn't like to focus right here. Um, I probably need to come back and work on this a little more. I'd like them to match. Doesn't take much. All right. Here I'm working so, I can't really grab like this because I'm gonna, that hurts. So, sometimes I'll grab overhand, same kind of a deal, but Come in from the top, I get that contact. I can stay clear of the, of the spinning chuck this way. I'm just trying to inch up, well not inch, uh, sneak up on, on this, on this spindle's diameter. One of the things that I'll, that I do, hang on a second, I'm thinking about one thing and doing another, sorry about that. So in the, in the spirit of practice, one of the things that I like to do occasionally is get out my skew and just kind of get rid of some of the the bumps and ridges that I've left with my gouge. This planing cut is probably the simplest cut you can make with a skew. And to me, every Every tool, every gouge we use is a skew. It's all just a cutting edge. Some of them, we've bent the cutting edge around, a, around an arc, but I mean they're all just cutting edges. This is kind of the purest thing. Uh, this particular skew is a round-handled skew. I really like this. This was a Eric Lofstrom. Uh, deal from a couple of symposiums ago. Uh, this is a drill bit, one of those aircraft drill bits. I cut the, the, um, the flutes of the drill were up here, cut them off and, and ground a skew. The neat thing about this skew is if it catches, it just rolls, whereas a flat bodied skew, if it catches, it'll slam down onto the tool rest. So this is a little more forgiving if you're a little scared of a skew. Uh, make yourself a skew out of a round round something. I want to get rid of this and then we're going to move on and see how we're doing. 
All right, I want to put a chamfer on here, get rid of some of this material, chamfer this back. little ridge there that's just bothering me and now I can get my parting tool and aim for a quarter inch and get my sharpened wrench out Find the quarter inch and then with my parting tool just match that diameter on the rest of the and come in and undercut this again so it'll sit down flush on the so it'll sit down flush on the base all right I think we have just enough time. Um, to do a little die. Because why not? It's fun. <clears throat> I use um, India ink for my uh, for dyeing these. I've had really good luck with it. I know a lot of people use other things. Um, a lot of folks will will use. Uh, shoe polish or whatever else but for me India ink's been working so I'm sticking with it I put it in this little dropper bottle because I, I bought what looked like a reasonable amount off of Amazon um, it was like a quart so I've got India ink forever um, but this is just real simple it's, it's good to have uh, gloves because this stuff does not really come off. It's good to have some protection for your lathe um, or do this on somebody else's lathe. And just wipe it on. At this, before I did this, normally I would have sanded up to about 800. Uh, the India, the water in the India ink is going to raise the grain so after I apply the coat I'll give it I don't know, 10 seconds or whatever it takes to dry and sand it again uh, down to up sand it again with 800 uh, sometimes I'll wet sand with the India ink at 800 uh, but usually not because it makes a mess sand it again put another coat of of India ink on it and you get a nice if it's sanded down to like 800 you get a really nice um, really nice finish on it nice deep black and I finish my pieces with spray lacquer and it shines up really nice uh, and I think it looks pretty good all right let's part this off and see what we ended up with Now the important thing before you part this off, I can't just go and cut this off because I do have some tailstock pressure here. And if I cut this off and I've got tailstock pressure, as soon as I cut through this piece of wood, it's going to move that direction because the tailstock is pushing it that direction. It moves that direction, it bangs up into what's left of the material here and you don't have a spindle anymore especially if you've made it uh, thinner than we did here so I'm gonna back off the live center pretty much until it stops turning it's squeaking in there so it's just barely touching now when I part this off and I go all the way through it had just a teeny fraction to move toward the tailstock and didn't bind up down here 
and I can I can save it. So that's an easy thing to forget the first time. It's um, pretty easy to remember right after you didn't do it that you should have done it. So let's see what we ended up with. I've got we've got a nice bowl. I really like uh, the figure that I that we found in there. Uh, I didn't think there was going to be as much. Uh, that'll shine up really nice. I can cut that stem off, and I'm still undecided about the this bead, but I can cut this stem off. And this base will fit right on there. I can sand down uh, this this nub here, and that base will fit right on there, and we'll have a nice little little goblet. The way I glue these up is that piece that I had in the when I talked about reverse chucking the uh, the bowl. I'll put something like this in the in the headstock. Put the bowl on there, probably just give it a little tape to hold on to it so it just doesn't disappear, doesn't fall down. And then on the tailstock side, I want something similar. This is the live center that came with this with this lathe, the Powermatic or Jet or whoever, they're all about the same. I don't quite remember, but I think that's a three-quarter inch thread right there. Um, you don't really need to know because you put your live center in your pocket, you go to the hardware store and you find a nut that will screw on there. I drilled a hole in a chunk of wood, epoxied the nut in the hole, thread it on the live center. We can then mount it in the lathe. Whoop, there. And I could put a, a center, a drive center, up against this, spin it, put a tenon on the back side, take it off of, take it off of the live center, turn it around into chuck, and turn whatever shape I want on the face. I've got several of these. Um, this is a nice kind of flat one. It's got a little cone in the middle because um, it, it's it's done several different things. But one of the things that it does for me. is I'll put the base of the of a goblet on there, get it centered up, tape it on. I've got the, the cup on a scrap piece of wood in a chuck. I've got the base on this piece in the tailstock. And I can just use the lathe as a clamp to hold them together. Um, when you do that, uh, give the headstock a gentle spin uh, the live center should spin with it. Give it a gentle spin, and if that spindle uh, turns on itself, then then you're good. If it's moving around like that, then you're off center, and you want to you want to straighten it up. Because um, if it's off center when you glue it, it'll be off center uh, forever. Um, two part epoxy, just a little bit in the on the base and on the top, and good to go. Any questions, comments, concerns? Everybody still awake? Awake, that was good. Yeah. All right, everybody gonna go make a goblet now? Yeah. You got awesome. time, I think. <laughs> awesome demo. Yeah, very awesome. Thank you. The thing the one thing I like about this is you can make a goblet out of a solid piece of wood, but making it three pieces, you just get a little more flexibility and in uh, in what you can do, um, and and kind of the woods you can you can you can choose and and uh, and stuff. And I've been really happy with uh, maple. I know a lot of people would rather see, you know, black wood or something like that. But um, you know, honestly, nobody can tell. And for for me, these goblets, the the spindle is not is not the centerpiece. It should be. I'm trying to feature that piece of wood on top, and the spindle needs to almost just disappear. Um, 
and you know just enough decoration to make it look like something but just almost not be there so anyway very good thanks dave very nice Yay. good job dave very Thank nice you.